Hello, I'm Paul Linnis, Professor of Shakespeare Studies, and welcome to my channel, Shakespeare for All. This is one of three videos on A Midsummer Night's Dream dealing with characterisation, plot and context. In this episode, we'll be talking about the characters. Now, there are three main parts to this talk. There's a general plot overview, some comments on the various groups of characters, and then study tips for each group using textual examples. That's the three main sections. I'll finish off with a list of keywords, which is what I usually do. I use the online version of the text from MIT, together with the Arden 3rd edition. If you're studying for any assessments, an edition with good supporting material, introduction notes, all that kind of thing, that's useful. And if you want to know more, please remember to subscribe. But before we do, there's a few things I'd like to mention. We're beginning to get some momentum, quite a few views on subscriptions, so thank you very much. This has helped me reconnect with a few people, like Patrick from Poland, who's an MA student of mine in Warsaw, now an English teacher himself. Now, I know that A Midsummer Night's Dream has been popular in Poland for a very long time, so I hope you find this one useful, Patrick. I've also had a more local request for some videos specifically on this play. This channel's still relatively new, but I do have a list of the main plays that people tend to study for assessments in England. A Midsummer Night's Dream isn't one of them in quite the way it used to be, but I was always intending to talk about this one at one point. Thanks to suggestions and feedback, I've moved it up the schedule. Now, this is the third play we've discussed on the channel, and it's time to say a huge thanks to my daughter, Kate, because she puts in huge amounts of work editing these videos. This is a family effort, and Kate is a linchpin, so thank you very much. So the first group of characters that we'll look at is the Athenian aristocracy. There are quite a few of them and they begin the play. There's Theseus, who's the heroic, mythic leader of Athens. He's the guy who killed the Minotaur, by the way. There's Queen Hippolyta of the Amazons, or Hippolyta, depending on the poetry, you can pronounce it either way, so don't get too hung up on it. The Amazons have just been defeated by Theseus in battle prior to the beginning of the play, and he's intending to marry her. There's also a guy called Aegeus, who's an older lad. He's a father of the noble woman Hermia. Hermia, obviously his daughter, she wants to marry the nobleman Lysander. She has a boyfriend. Unfortunately for her, although Lysander is in love with her, so too, or at least so he says, is another nobleman called Demetrius. He has Aegeus's permission to marry Hermia against her will. There's also Helena, she turns up slightly later, she's Hermia's oldest and best friend and is Demetrius's former girlfriend. He's basically dumped her so he can marry Hermia. So that's the Athenian nobility. The second main group is the Athenian workers. So we have people from two different sets of social classes, what we would call social classes. In this group, the main role is Bottom the Weaver, and yes, his name is Bottom. There's also Quince the Carpenter, Flute the Bellows Mender, Snout the Tinker, Snug the Joiner, appropriately named because he joins things snugly, and Starveling the Tailor, which again is appropriate because tailors are supposed to be really thin. The third main group of characters is the Woodland Fairies. Oberon, the King of the Fae, his servant Puck, and Titania, the Queen of the Fairies. There are also various members of Titania's part of the fairy court, but we're not going to bother too much about them. They're relatively minor roles. Now, one thing that we have to do with this play, I don't always do this, but with this one it's absolutely essential, is to basically give you a general overview of the plot before we look at the various groups of characters in and of themselves. The reason for this is because it's a very complex plot, very sophisticated, very intricate. So you need to know how the various groups of characters fit into the plot so you can tell who's who. As I've said, there are three groups of characters, right? That's a lot of people. This play has no single main character or even a main pair of characters. There's an ensemble, three separate groups. There's a separate video that goes into much more detail about the plot, but you need a sense of what happens in the play in order to recognise the various characters. So I'm going to do a stripped down version 
and I'll put a schematic for each act on the screen, but we won't necessarily read through all of it. I'll pick out kind of the main points. So this is how the play begins. This is Act 1. This is us now on a general overview of the plot. The play starts in Athens with romantic intrigue among the aristocracy, the first group we've already mentioned. We then meet the second group, the ordinary citizens. Now, Duke, Shakespeare calls him a Duke. He wasn't a Duke, he was a mythic hero. Anyway, Shakespeare calls him a Duke. Theseus wants a party to celebrate his marriage to the Queen of the Amazons, Hippolyta, that he's just effectively conquered. The old nobleman turns up, Aegeus, with his only child, his daughter Hermia. He wants her to marry Demetrius, so he's tagging along as well, as is Lysander, Hermia's boyfriend. Theseus rules that the patriarchal law of Athens requires Hermia to do what her father demands, or else, he rules, become a votary of the virgin goddess Diana, basically the ancient Greek equivalent of a nun. Hermia and Lysander decide they're going to run away together to get married. They're going to go via the woods outside Athens and go somewhere where their father doesn't have any say in what they do. At this point, Helena enters, and I've already mentioned her. She's Hermia's best friend, her oldest friend, and she's the woman Demetrius has dumped so he can marry Hermia. Lysander and Hermia have a conversation with Helena, and they tell her that they're going to run to the woods, and they then leave. Helena then gets stage time on her own. Watch for this. It's, it, of all the women in the play, it's only Helena and Hermia who get soliloquies. That gives them some importance. Soliloquy, speech, delivered directly to the audience by character on their own on the stage. Helena gets one at this point. This emphasises how important she's going to be. She says to the audience, direct conversation with the audience, I'm not happy about this. I am going to go off and tell Demetrius and I'm going to follow them. We then shift, now that we've had the initial intrigue among the aristocracy, we shift to Bottom and his friends, group two, the normal people of Athens, and they're discussing putting on a play for the Duke's wedding entertainment. They're the lower orders of Athenian society. They represent the vast majority of the people. They agree to meet later at the Duke's oak in the forest, the same woods that Hermia and Lysander are about to run away. So the two groups of people from Athens, from different social classes, are going into the same location separately. That's the beginning of the play. You can already see that there are multiple groups here, it's quite complex. We now move to Act 2, and the play moves from Athens to the woods. And it turns out that the woods are not entirely safe. They're not necessarily neutral, because there's a conflict between Titania, the fairy queen, and her husband, Oberon. They're fighting over an Indian boy who is the son of her priestess who died in childbirth. She wants to rear the boy in memory of her servant. Oberon wants to go hunting with him, so there's a conflict. Bit of a fight between them. She leaves, Titania leaves with her courtiers, and Oberon sends his servant Puck to fetch a special flower for him, and this is going to be extremely important. Oberon then hides as two of the Athenians enter arguing. It's Helena and Demetrius. The audience is probably expecting Hermia and Lysander because we know this is where they're coming. It's actually Helena and Demetrius, and they're in the middle of a fight, basically. Oberon watches this. When Puck comes back with the flower after they've gone into the woods again, Oberon takes the flower but gives some to Puck and he says, I've just seen this young Athenian guy. He's having a spat with his girlfriend, or his former girlfriend. Basically, I want you to use this juice on him. Drug him so that he loves her again. And that'll resolve everything. So Puck heads off to do that. Titania's court then comes in. Bit of moving around the place and they head off and leave the fairy queen to sleep. That's important because Oberon's still invisible. And what he does is he squeezes the juice of the flower on her eyes and then leaves her. She, the idea is she will fall in love with the first person she sees when she wakes up. So she's drugged, basically. At this point, with the fairy queen asleep in some corner of the stage somewhere, Lysander and Hermia come in. 
We've been expecting them for a while. They're the two young Athenians from earlier. They're escaping the patriarchal law of the father in Athens. They turn up and they go to sleep because they're tired. Puck then comes in and squeezes the juice of the flower on Lysander's eyes because he doesn't realise it's the wrong guy. Okay, so there's a mistake being made here. And then Puck heads off. Demetrius and Helena then turn up. Their movement on and off stage is very complex. This is why I think you need to understand the plot to some extent before you can see what we're going to say about the characters. And they're having another fight. And Demetrius basically abandons her in the forest. Now what happens is the noise of their fight as Demetrius runs off wakes Lysander. So Hermes on the ground beside him asleep. He wakes up. First thing he sees is Helena and he's been drummed. He's had this love potion smeared on his eyes. So he falls in love with Helena. She's outraged. There's a fight between them and the two of them run off. Remember Titania's asleep on the stage all the way through this. Hermia wakes up, finds herself all alone, alone in the woods and goes off to find Lysander. So you've got all these people wandering around the, room, the woods and some of them are drugged, effectively. We now move into the main action of the play, which is Act 3, with the central confusion in the woods. Bottom and his friends turn up at this point. We've seen what the aristocrats are up to in the woods. Now we see what the workers do in the woods. Puck has a look and decides he's going to have some fun at their expense. Bottom leaves the stage at one point as part of the rehearsal and Puck follows him. What Puck does, famously, is he changes his head into an ass's head. Bottom comes back on. His friends all run away in terror. He's got no idea what's going on. He doesn't realise he's been changed. So he sings a little song to himself to keep his spirits up. This wakes up Titania. Remember, she's been asleep on stage all the time here. And she falls in love with this guy with the head of an ass because it's the first thing she sees when she wakes up. So it's very complicated and very silly. Bit of stage movement. And Demetrius enters with Hermia. Oberon and Puck are watching, and Oberon realises, you've drugged the wrong guy here. What are you up to? So Oberon drugs Demetrius after ordering Puck to go and get the other Athenians. He's trying to sort it all out now. Lysander and Helena arrive. They're arguing with Demetrius. He's been drugged as well. He falls back in love with Helena. So now we have three different people all under the influence. Titania, who's in love with a man with the head of an ass. Demetrius, who's back in love with Helena, and Lysander, who's mistakenly in love with Helena. There's a massive four-way spat between all four Athenians. They're all outraged, confused, all the rest of it. And Puck is basically told by his boss to sort it all out. Oberon just looks at him and says, you're enjoying this, aren't you? Did you do this deliberately? Puck's like, no, 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 no. I didn't know there were two Athenian men. Neither did you, but it's funny. So Puck uses voice tricks to bring them all together. They all start falling asleep on the stage and Puck cures Lysander by giving him a second dose of the drug. But he leaves Demetrius' drug. That is very important. It's important for the plot. It's also important for the characterisation. Demetrius is permanently changed by his experiences in the wood. He's the only one who is. We then have Act 4. This is the second main series of events in the wood with the Athenians. And basically there's a series of resolutions and then we return to Athens. Titania and Bottom come in and eventually go asleep. So you've actually got six different people asleep on stage at the moment. The four Athenians plus Bottom plus Titania. Oberon squeezes a second dose on his wife's eyelids to cure her, wakes her up. They're reconciled. She's a bit fuzzy because she doesn't know what's been happening. And they head off. You've now got Bottom asleep in one part of the stage and the four Athenians asleep. The hunt appears at this point. The Athenian aristocracy, Duke Theseus and his court, have arrived in the woods and they find the four lovers. So they all wake up confused and Demetrius says, I don't know why, but I've decided I'm no longer in love with Hermia, so can I uh, marry Helena, please? Which is what I should have done all along. And Gia says yes and it's all resolved. Of course, it's resolved because Demetrius remains under the influence. There's then a famous prose soliloquy, not poetic, prose soliloquy, normal speech by Bottom, as he wakes up alone on the stage, looks around, around bewildered and talks about, oh, I don't know what happened here. There's then a shift, very swift 
shift back to Athens to remind us of Bottom's friends. They're in Athens, they're wondering, where's Bottom, what are we going to do about this play? So that brings us back to Athens. So now we move on to Act 5, which is a long single scene. It's the night of the weddings, it's the feast, it's the celebration. We have three married couples, Hippolyta and Theseus, Lysander and Hermia, Helena and Demetrius. Remember, Demetrius is still drugged, so he's now married to Helena. Bottom and his friends perform their play, Pyramus and Tisbe, really badly, and then everyone goes off to bed, and the fairies arrive to bless the nuptials, and Puck speaks an epilogue. Now, like I say, there is a separate video on the plot of the play to help you untangle all of this, but you need some sense of the various movements on and off the stage, the movements between the locations, and the interactions between the various members of the cast. Like I say, there are three groups of actors, there's no single pair, no main pair. So what matters is the ensemble, the whole cast. There's no protagonist, there's no antagonist, there isn't even a Romeo and Juliet or an Antony and Cleopatra. To recap, the three main groups are the Athenian aristocracy, Theseus and Hippolyta, Hermia and Lysander, Demetrius and Helena, and the J.S. Hermia's dad. We have the Athenian artisans, Bottom and his friends, who are trying to become actors badly, and we have Titania and Oberon with Puck. There are other minor characters like the Master of Ceremonies for Theseus' court and various minor fairies attending Titania, but we'll not talk about them. We'll concentrate on the main groups, the three main groups. Starting with Duke, Theseus and Hippolyta. Now you have to remember that the play begins with the memory of a conflict. Okay? Theseus, the great Athenian hero, has defeated the Amazons by force, military conquest, and is planning to marry their queen, Hippolyta. We don't actually find out what she thinks about this. However, one way this is often interpreted in modern performances is that she's not at all happy about this. She's basically got no choice. She's part of the spoils of war. Her frustration often in performance visibly boils over when Theseus lays down the patriarchal law of Athens to Hermia and says, you have to do what your dad said. Right. So remember that there's a kind of gender conflict going on. It's about the power of the men over the women. Now in the woods, there's a thematic link with the conflict in Athens because we have Oberon and Titania who are having a marital spat. They're in open conflict. Now unlike Theseus, Oberon doesn't control his wife. He uses drugs and subterfuge to get his way instead. He doesn't conquer her. What all of this does, you could argue, is it reinforces the violence of patriarchy. Theseus has conquered Hippolyta, Oberon uses drugs on his wife. So the men are, as characters, perhaps not ideal, they're perhaps not the nicest people in the play. What might seem like a light fairy play with lots of comic confusion actually could turn out to have darker undertones, which perhaps makes it more interesting. We'll now talk a little bit about the two young couples, the Athenian nobles, Hermia and Lysander on the one hand, and Helena and Demetrius on the other. Now the main action of the play starts when Hermia and Lysander decide to elope. They do a runner. Hermia's best friend, Helena, who's been dumped by Demetrius, who now wants to marry Hermia, is told by them that this is what they're up to. Of course, all of this is a serious problem because Demetrius has the approval of Hermia's father to marry her against her will. Now, thanks to Puck's interference in the woods with the love drug, the situation becomes even more complicated when Lysander dumps Hermia and falls for Helena as well. We've already seen that happen. And all is finally settled. It takes a while, but it is resolved when Lysander is cured. And again, I have to reinforce this, Demetrius is left drugged, okay? So that he has to marry Helena. And so everything is sorted out in a roundabout way, after a lot of confusion. Now these shenanigans can be played to echo the main gendered conflict between Theseus and Hippolyta that started the play, shadowed by that between Titania and Oberon. So what I'm suggesting is the characterization is obviously one way to deal with it, performance, is to flavour it. Flavour it in accordance with gender hierarchy, gender politics. Now the problem here is how you differentiate between the two young men and the two young women on the stage so the audience can keep track of who's who 
in all the confusion in the woods. Now, one standard way to do this, I alluded to this earlier with Helena and her soliloquy, is to emphasise the relative importance of Hermia and Helena. This has some textual authority because they both have soliloquy time. You could argue that their stage importance and their discursive importance pulls against the patriarchal dictate that requires them to be compliant and submissive because they happen to be women. These two are anything but. This makes them more interesting than the men. It also suggests there isn't a clear demarcation between Lysander and Demetrius. It's really easy to forget which one of them is which. And maybe that's deliberate on the play's part. It's basically suggesting these men are interchangeable. Could you keep up? It's teasing the audience. Maybe deliberately confusing. It's time to talk about Bottom and his friends, the artisans. They provide what we would call class politics. They function as a light relief. They move audience attention away from the intricate relationship between Titania and Oberon, as well as the shenanigans with the four Athenian youths. Their very appallingly rubbish play about Pyramus and Tisbe at the end is a kind of submerged commentary on A Midsummer Night's Dream. It's a play within a play, but it comments on the main action. The story of Pyramus and Tisbe is a tragedy caused by feuding families. Pretty much in a way that could have caused serious harm to Hermia and Lysander, if you think about it like that. So, yes, it's comic, yes, it's absurd, but actually there's an undertone there. The performance is a play within the play, and this foregrounds the importance of acting. This is a self-referential drama. Renaissance drama does this a lot. This is a comedy that specialises in it. So now what we'll do is move on to the study tips section of this video. I'll put some textual samples on the screen for you. There are plenty of others you can find for yourselves. I'll pick some salient examples. I won't go through them in total detail. I'll just pick out the main points for you. So you get an idea what happens with these various characters. So the first one you'll see is from near the beginning of the play. It's Theseus and Hippolyta, Hippolyta, however you want to pronounce her, in conflict. Hippolyta spoils a warn out, begins with a seeming mutual speech by the two of them. And then Theseus turns to her and says, I wooed thee with my sword and won thy love doing thee injuries. Now, she never comments on whether or not she actually does love him. He would like to think she does, but how much choice does she have really? So the play starts with a memory of a gendered conflict. That is extremely important because that's going to be developed as you move through the play. Now, towards the end of the play, when everything starts to come together and he's married Hippolyta, Theseus speaks, it's quite a famous speech, about what he thinks is going on in the brains of, of lovers and madmen and poets and other such lunatics because he's utterly rational, or at least he likes to think he is. Now, it's slightly ironic because the whole action of the play pulls against what he's saying. He's wrong. The action of the play shows he's wrong. Demetrius is marrying Helena because he's still drugged. Okay? He's still under the influence. He's still not in his right mind. So Theseus gets it wrong. This is important. This is what he says. Lovers and madmen have such seething brains. I like seething brains. Such shaping fantasies that apprehend more than cool reason ever comprehends. The lunatic, the lover and the poet are of imagination all compact. These are useful lines that you can quote or refer to in an assessment. So he's basically saying, I don't trust irrational people. He goes on, the poet's eye in fine frenzy rolling doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven. Basically, poet's eyes roll all over the place because they can't tell the difference between the earth and the heaven. So they mix things up. They're irrational. The poet's pen turns them to shapes and gives to Airy nothing, a local habitation and a name. Now, I've picked this speech because there are some famous lines in here, but it shows what Theseus thinks of the world and the action of the play completely contradicts all of it. So that's worth saying. Theseus' character is super rational and probably quite wrong. There you go. We'll now look at the conflict between Titania and Oberon. Titania is very loyal to the memory of her dead priestess, so you could argue she has a moral high ground. Oberon wins because he drugs her. 
Right, that's slightly unpleasant. This is what she says. She's having a fight with him. Set your heart at rest. The fairy land buys not the child of me. Her mother was a votress of my order. And then slightly later, but she being mortal of that boy did die. And for her sake do I rear up her boy, and for her sake I will not part with him. You can really spit these lines out because they're monosyllables. They're meant to be emphasised. And she's quite adamant. She's not doing what her husband said for all the right reasons. So why is he fighting with her? Because he wants to party. Okay, He wants to take the lad and go hunting. She's serious. He is not. We'll now have a look at something Oberon says. This is a useful little quotation for you. Oberon is devious and manipulative and untrustworthy. To get his own way, he has to drug his wife. This is the description of the flower that he's going to use to do it. He's talking to Puck and he's saying, go and get me this flower. Maidens call it love in idleness. Fetch me that flower, the herb I showed thee once. The juice of it on sleeping eyelids laid will make man or woman madly dote upon the next live creature that it sees. So that's an extremely central plot moment. This is a character plotting to drug his own wife. Okay. Puck himself loves all of this. Puck is knowingly mischievous. Yes, he gets it wrong by chance, but he enjoys it. Right? He revels in it. And at the end of the play, it's quite significant. He's the one who gets to speak an epilogue. He steps out of the action and talks to the audience directly. And this is what he says. Again, these are very famous lines. If we shadows have offended, think but this and all is mended. So it's rhyming couplets that you have but slumbered here while these visions did appear. It's saying to the audience, you've been manipulated in a dream as well. This weak and idle theme, he calls it. No more yielding but a dream. Then he says, gentles do not reprehend. Now, we've lost the social resonances of that term. We say ladies and gentlemen as, as normal. In this period, gentle folk are quite high up the social scale. Most of Shakespeare's audience were nowhere near gentle folk. They were mostly artisans standing around the stage on the ground floor, paying a penny to get in and having fun. This is a compliment to an unruly audience. It's a very ironic, knowing compliment. And he says, if you pardon, we will mend. And as I am an honest puck, and we know from the action, is anything but honest. So there are layers of meaning all the way through this play. Irony upon irony, Theseus talking about being super rational when the whole action of the play is anything but Puck pretending to be honest. So you, what you see is what you get, okay? And that's what the play does to you. Now I've mentioned that Helena and Hermia are perhaps more <laughs> interesting than their male counterparts, Lysander and Demetrius. This is Helena. This is when she's in soliloquy. She's just found out, this is from quite early on in the play, she's just found out that Hermia and Lysander are running off to the woods because they want to escape Athens. And she's bemoaning her lot to the audience. She says, through Athens I am thought as fair as she. But what of that? Demetrius thinks not so. She's still in love with the guy. He's dumped her for Hermia. She's saying everybody in Athens thinks I'm as fair. What does that word fair mean? Physically attractive? Maybe Helena's an heiress as well. You don't actually know her background, but basically she's as good a catch. Demetrius has dumped her and she's not happy about it. There's a very complicated line, again monosyllable. He will not know what all but he do know. And as he errs, dotting on Hermia's eyes, so I, admiring of his qualities. She's basically saying, he's ignoring me, dotting on Hermia, and I'm admiring him. So we're stuck. She says something, this is a really useful line. Love looks not with the eyes, but with the mind. Again, monosyllables. That completely contradicts what Theseus says later in the play, which we've already looked at. So Helena is very passionate, she's very forthright, and she's good at planning. She's very sensible, very organised, highly intelligent, and probably more rational than most of the men in the play. Hermia also has a soliloquy. Hers comes when she wakes up in the wood on her own because Lysander has fallen in love with Helena and gone off into the woods chasing after her. And as that happens, Hermia starts to wake up and she's been having a dream. 
So it's a dream within a dream. And Hermia says, help me, Lysander, help me. Do thy best to pluck this crawling serpent from my breast. So she's having a bad dream. Her, if you like, in modern terms, her subconscious is telling her something's gone wrong. It has. He's just dumped her and she doesn't even know about it because he's been drugged. So that's what's happening. But her emotional intelligence is showing through. She's beginning to realise there's a problem. And of course, the imagery of a serpent at the breast is not neutral not in this period. It reminds you of the snake in the Garden of Eden or perhaps Cleopatra dying with a serpent at the breast. And this is what she says, me thought a serpent eat my heart away and you sat smiling at his cruel play. Because of course that's effectively what he's doing. He's now fallen in love with Helena. She knows this at some level. So she's really bright. So the women are both stronger than the men and they get more stage time on their own than the men. So the question is why? If you talk about that, hopefully you get more points if you're writing on it. It's also time to talk about <laughs> Bottom's dream. Uh, Bottom is sympathetic. He's, he's a good fun character. He's comically confused. He can hardly string two words together. And he's the butt of Puck's joke in the forest. The butt. Bottom. Well, there's all sorts of puns here, right? So he's given the head of an ass and the fairy queen falls in love with him. He's now waking up, he's completely alone on the stage. He gets a soliloquy, right? And it's in prose because he's not a noble. So he speaks normal language. And this is worth reading out in some detail. I've had a most rare vision. I've had a dream past the wit of man to say what dream it was. So he's talking about his dream. Man is but an ass if you go about to expound this dream. And of course the audience is tittering because they've seen him with an ass's head. He's got half memories of what happened. Me thought I was, there is no man can tell what. Me thought I was, and me thought I had. You can see the way the, the language works. But man is but a patched fool if you offer to say what me thought I had. He said, nah, 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 that, that, that can't have happened. Watch this language, this is classic bottom. The eye of man hath not heard, the ear of man hath not seen. Man's hand is not able to taste, his tongue to conceive, nor his heart to report what my dream was. So not only is it misprision, speaking wrongly, his senses are mixed up. It's what the medics call synesthesia. His eye can hear things, his ear can see things and so on. So he's getting everything wrong. He's completely confused. He's woken up. He doesn't know what's going on. And this is what he says. It's brilliant language, but it's comically confused. And this is, this is what he decides. I will get Peter Quince to write a ballad of this dream. It shall be called Bottom's Dream because it hath no bottom. So there's your series of puns as well. Bottom's a character most people like to play. Anyway, I hope this has given you enough to go on with the plays characters. I'm not suggesting there's much new character development, okay? There's too much going on in interrelationships, interaction, entanglement between the characters. The only character you could argue who changes as a result of his experiences in the woods is Demetrius because he's still under the influence. What we'll do now is we'll finish with a list of the key words I've been using as we've described all of this. So the first one, if you can get some of these in an essay, it helps. Ensemble, the group of actors. Pretty much the whole cast matters in this play in different ways at different points. Pyramus and Tisby is an episode from Ovid's Metamorphoses in which two lovers from rival houses are destroyed when they try to elope via a wilderness, a woods, like the forest in the Midsummer Night's Dream. If you're concentrating on Puck, remember he speaks the epilogue, which is the end piece of a character stepping out of the action to address the audience directly. Misprision by Bottom, we've just been looking at that, the way he's always mixing up his words. And he has synesthesia, these terms are on the screen so you can see them. This one's difficult to spell. It's a technical medical term for mixed up senses. It's the physical equivalent of misprision. If anybody's going to suffer from it, it's going to be Bottom. It makes him sympathetic. Overall, this is a self-referential drama. I've used that phrase before. 
There are many terms for this. You'll see others by critics like metadrama, metatheatrical, meaning a drama or theatrical logic that draws attention to itself. It says, I'm a drama, I'm a play. It's a bit unnecessary because it's, it's a set of posh critical terms. These are difficult phrases. To describe something that's actually quite straightforward, much Renaissance drama, many of these plays foreground the fact of plays, they're self-referential, they're aware of their own artificiality. And in A Midsummer Night's Dream, this is one of the functions of the deliberately inept performance of the play within the play, Pyramus and Tisbe. So that seems like a good place to stop. Good luck with your studies, and if you want to know more, there are videos on plot and context for A Midsummer Night's Dream, so please remember to subscribe.